We want to welcome in our center worshipers today and those that are streaming live with us, wherever they may be, and uh, are so thankful that you are here as well. What was, up to this point, the greatest day of your life? If you just stop for a moment, that's not an easy question to answer. I have additional pressure to answer it in the right way today because my wife is in this service. I think she has a particular expectation, or I think she would, of how I should answer that question. What is the greatest day of your life? Well, for my own safety, I would say, well, it's a wonderful day that I married my wife. What would be in your top three? Birth of a child, graduation day, think for just a moment, if we ask Malcolm or John or whoever we might ask today, what was the greatest day of your life? Well, one of the top three or four days that I remember in my life was way back in the early 1970s, beginning to date myself. I'm an old, old person. And the President of the United States was going to fly into Longview, Texas. Gregg County Airport had this massive 10,000, whatever it was, feet, I mean, huge runway, and school turned out. No need to get into the president's name. And I'm sure I'll get all kinds of emails about that and find Marine will handle those for me. But school turned out. We took our lawn chairs went out plenty early. We knew the arrival time of Air Force One. And coming in with fighter jets and all kinds of things. And so out of school we went. That's the most important thing I remember from elementary school. Out of school. Those words were significant. Now why are we going out here in our lawn chairs? The president's coming. He's coming. Coming here to Longview of all things. Man, we painted a big American flag down there at the end of the runway. We had that dude mowed down. It's never been mowed at the airport. That, it was manicured. There were people in dark suits running around all over out there around the runway, around the fences, and dogs on chains. It, it, it was a big deal. Somebody special was coming. But I don't know how you would answer that question today. But I do know how you'll answer that question at some point in eternity. Because the Bible tells us when the Lord Jesus returns, that will be the day. There'll be no greater day in your life than when the Lord Jesus returns. And these last several weeks, you and I have been talking about who we are. Yeah, we're people of prayer, we're people of the word. But we're also people that our lives are driven by this outer ring of expectancy. You and I are anticipating something. We're on the very cusp of another presidential election. Those things roll around every four years. Many of you have seen many, many elections. And the outcome of that, one side's going to be excited, one side's going to be deflated. It'll take a few weeks for the side that's deflated, but at some point they're going to bounce back and figure out, well, four years from now we'll get after them again. And life will go on. Life will go on over and over and over in all kinds of cycles, but there'll be a moment that life will change for all of us immediately. And so today I want to speak out of the book of 1 Thessalonians. Would you turn and join me there? We're going to be reading a number of passages in just a moment. 1 Thessalonians, and would you go over to chapter called number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because today I I want us to be reminded that we, as a New Testament body, are a people that are waiting and anticipating a very, very special day. The day that our Lord and Savior will return. And let's read in a copy of God's Word. I hope you brought a copy. If not, maybe they'll be kind enough to project it up behind me. The Bible says this. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 13. I hope you'll follow along. I would tell you to slide over and read along with somebody, but you can't do that right now. Keep your distance, all right? 
Verse number 13, brothers and sisters, remember Paul's writing to that church at Thessalonica. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve Sorrow not, is the way the King James translates that, like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Could we just uh, throw on the brakes for a moment and just understand the text? Paul, as you know, mentoring a number of churches. We know really, I think, looking back, that his problem child church was Corinth. No question about that probably wrote more to them, even extra biblical texts that aren't in the canon of scripture uh, than any other church. But one of those churches was the church at Thessalonica. And Paul obviously has been preaching to them and teaching, and their leadership's been teaching that even though the Lord has just recently ascended, there was going to be a day that he was coming back. And so they had in their minds it would be in their lifetime. And of course, none of us know exactly which lifetime it'll be. Bible says, no man knoweth. We're not to be speculating and as so many silly people try to do. I mean, only God himself knows when that coming, that second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will occur, and it will occur. But this church had a lot of questions. They were struggling. They began to figure out some things as their theology base began to build, One of those important questions that they had come up with in their hearts is, hey, there's some people that we deeply have loved that have died. And those individuals are going to miss it. Papaw's going to miss the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Mammal, an infant child that died of some disease or some malady. And they began to think about, hey, man, The Lord's going to come and he's going to take us with him. And then these that are in the grave, they're going to miss out. And you know, it's interesting to me because these people in Thessalonica, they were really facing three questions, three challenges that we all face. They were facing the problem, first of all, of ignorance. Things they just didn't know, not ignorance in a slanderous way, but they just didn't understand. It was an intellectual problem for them. Paul had been teaching about the coming of Christ. And then there was that question of sorrow. They were broken about the Lord Jesus had died, but he had ascended. There was some excitement about that. But over a course of years, that excitement had waned. It had had tailed off. And now they were wrapped up in this question of, well, we know he's going to come back one day. But what about this and what about that? And there was sorrow that filled their hearts. And then hopelessness. That was a thing that they battled over and over. And those are problems that you and I so often deal with. Someone well said, sorrow always looks back. Worry always looks around. But faith always looks ahead. And that is exactly what Paul tried to direct them to do. Let your faith now look ahead. Did you, would you look down in verse number 18 and we'll come back and build all of these verses in between verses 13 and verse 18. But at the end of that little section, end of chapter four, it just says, therefore, encourage one another. Some of you have this translation, don't you? Comfort one another with these words. You see, the second coming, that day that guides so many of our lives, our New Testament body, knowing, being excited that he's going to be returning, understand that's not some incidental element in our lives. That is a fundamental element in our lives. And the people so confused in Thessalonica, and understand that so often people that teach out of these kind of passages do so to frighten or fear, but be of good cheer today because I want to bring these verses to you out of a sense of encouragement. There's three things I want you to jot down. Grab your little outline if you've not already done so. And let, here's three little things that we want to take away that are important because we are, no question about it, we are people that are waiting with great expectancy of a special day that's to come, the special day when our Lord and Savior shall return. Now notice, as we dissect these verses together today, right from God's word, what Paul teaches, not only the church at Thessalonica, but what he teaches us. 
about the importance of this second coming. First of all, he wants us to recognize something. He wants us to recognize this absolute certainty of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Paul wants to drive that home more than anything else initially. Look at how he does that in two fundamental ways, beginning in verse 14. Read along with me. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Look in verse 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now there's two obvious evidences that Paul just lays up on the table to get started with about how and the certainty of how the Lord Jesus will return, how we know that for sure. First of all, he suggests here, it comes out of the very gospel itself, the saving work of our Lord. Write that down. The saving work of our Lord. For we believe that Jesus died, rose again, so that we believe that God will bring Jesus, those who have with him, those who have fallen asleep in him. Now, some of you have a translation there that uses the word if, if he were to come. And understand, it's really a, this whole, this whole statement is a statement of assurance and confidence. We know that the second coming of the Lord Jesus is birthed out of the first coming. He came, he lived, he died, he was buried, he arose, and he what? Ascended into the heavens. Can I hear an amen to that? That is a very important progression to us. Our Lord came, he functioned, he carried out everything that he chose to do. By the way, the scripture teaches us that he chose to volitionally give up his own life to die as a permanent substitute for our sins. Put in that tomb, rose from the dead, and ascended into the heavenlies. And we believe that, don't we? We believe our Lord literally came. We believe that our Lord and Savior literally died. That he was literally, his body, his his remains were really, I mean, in a literal way, put into that tomb. And that he literally arose and was taken days later into the very heavenlies. That's so very important to understand that that is how the very consummation of our relationship with Christ and his promise to us and his sacrifice for us ties in directly. That is the gospel. The gospel is not the birth of the New Testament church. The gospel gospel is not some mission effort, as wonderful as those are. The gospel is that the Lord Jesus came, died, ascended, arose, and ascended for us as a substitution for our sins. And it's out of that faith covenant that you and I have got to believe that with certainty, turning from our sin to the Lord Jesus for life ahead. That, my friends, is the gospel. This past week, someone called me and they said, Pastor Mike, our daughter has prayed to receive Christ. I said, hallelujah. And they said, but, but, we're not so sure she knows what she's done. And I have heard this statement so many times, sometimes in the form of a question. Pastor, would you mind coming over to the house? And we want you to sit and talk with her to find out for sure if she really knows what she's done. Now, just applause here for parents that care enough to help lead their children to Christ. Amen? Woohoo! That's an exciting thing, isn't it? And also, praise the Lord for parents that would say, hey, we, we want to know with certainty. We, we want confirmation of this. But it took me back years ago to an old building that's now been moved up by New Diana called Barnwell Hall. 
That was where the first Baptist church of Gilmer, Texas offices were located for years. Had about 20 cats living up under old Barnwell Hall. When they moved it, we had a team of men at First Baptist Gilmer that caught and trapped all of those cats. Mustard sardines got them. I never was sitting down in there and there was a third grade girl. Parents came in. The grandpa was in the church. He came in. They all wanted to know the same thing. So here we are all spread out in the Baptist way. We had some small talk. You got it, don't you? Small talk. And then all of a sudden, they kind of looked at me with the bob. So I looked at her and I said, now, Rebecca, have you trusted Jesus as your Savior? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Well, we're all here because this is an important decision, I said. And I said, now, Rebecca, how do you know that you're saved? She said, well, Pastor Mike, I know that I'm saved because I did my part. And Jesus did his part. And I'm telling you, there was a hush that fell over the entire room. That didn't sound good. Here's Rebecca elementary and she thinks that she's done something she did some kind and I could just see the parents they had hissed up like a bunch of cats over there oh gosh so I asked her again Rebecca look at me look at Pastor Mike carefully how do you know that you were saved she said well I told you I did what I do And Jesus did what he does. And all of a sudden, something came over me, and I just said, well, I'm going to ask, boy, and this was a gamble, a third time, but can I rephrase my question? She said, yes, sir. I said, what exactly have you done, and what has Jesus done? And she said, I did the sinning. And Jesus did the saving. (laughs) Now, my friends, that right there was a moment in ministry that I'll never, ever forget. You see, out of the very core of who you and I are, knowing what Jesus has come and done, we've done our part, haven't we? And he did his But he reminded us, now that work is finished, but I will be coming back. I'll be coming back again. And you see, in Paul, that's what he's driving home here in verse 14. We believe the gospel. We believe that he died, that he arose. We believe that God, through Jesus, with Jesus, will bring those He'll be coming back, and he'll bring those that are with him. Now, that's an important concept. We'll get to that in just a moment. See, unless he comes again for us, do you understand that the gospel, as stated and as we know it, is going to be incomplete? You say, well, Pastor, the gospel's closed. Oh, no, no, no. The gospel, the work is finished, but there's more work to be done. The Lord Jesus is not through in that gospel package. He's coming back for us. You see, you've got to understand something. The crucifixion without his coronation, well, it would be incomplete. You've got to understand that justification, just because he saved us and justified us, that without his glorification, things would not be complete. How do we know with absolute certainty? How do we recognize that? You see, when we believe that Jesus rose again, that's just a precursor to your, res- to your resurrection, to my resurrection. You remember in the Old Testament, they had something called first fruits. You remember that? A lot of times pastor will teach first fruits when he teaches about stewardship. Because really that... First fruits was a very important aspect of total stewardship of life. Every spring when crops, when it got warm enough and trees began to bud and agriculture began to do its thing, you know, there, would be, there would be that first crop for you that are 
that cut hay, for instance. There's a first cutting. And we know that one of the things that was so important in Jewish life was that they would take those first fruit offerings, first peaches on the trees, first crop of wheat, whatever it may be, whatever came in first, and they, if they were close enough, they would take a portion of that, that of, of that first fruit offering, and they would take it all the way to Jerusalem, and they would offer that up. If they were too far and it was not possible, then they'd take it to the nearest place of worship and give it to the Levitical uh, uh, person there in that place of worship. But it was very important to them because it was, a, it was a sign and symbol that they were thankful to God for the harvest that was about to come. They had just the first portion of that. That's all they had, just the first portion. But it was also a very important time to them because it was a token that they needed to give back to remind them and to remind God that they recognized that everything we have, really, God, belongs to you anyway. All we're doing is bringing you back the first of all those things. And then later on, we know that the Jewish people, they love to party. When the harvest finally came in and its bounty, the whole thing, and it began to wrap up, they would have a festival. They have a whole harvest celebration. But it's important for us to understand that because over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 and 23, the Bible says, for as Adam in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ, the first fruits, then will he, when he comes, those who belong to him will be gathered with him. Do you understand this? This is important that you and I have the same heartbeat here. Why are we people of, of, that are waiting and anticipating this great second coming of the Lord Jesus? That's a big deal to us. That's a big, big deal to all of us. That drives us in many cases with anticipation forward. It helps hold us accountable in forward days as well. And knowing that, we've got to understand that this comes out of the very foundational, historical, supernatural Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what fuels this second coming. But not just the saving work of the Lord, but look in verse 15. He says it also comes the certainty out of the sure word of the Lord. Look at it in verse 15. According to the Lord's, look at, here it is, the Lord's word. Now you and I know we have history and we have the Bible. We know historical accounts, and we also have a Bible that provides us additional historical information. You know, if you go back and you look at your Bible from beginning to end, really about one-third of the total Bible, properly understood, that is, has the same concepts or some concepts of the second coming in it. I mean, when the Old Testament ends, we're getting this prophetic utterance of the very coming of the Lord Jesus when our New Testament ends, we're getting the same concept, but not from a standpoint that the Lord Jesus is coming. The Lord Jesus had already come as the New Testament closes, but now it's speaking of what? His second coming. So how can you and I have assurance? We have assurance out of God's word and out of the very work of God, the very gospel itself. Our Lord and Savior is coming Again, now you have to speak a little louder today because we're a little further apart. Look over one way or the other, but front and back and say, the Lord is coming again. Would you tell your neighbor that right now? Tell them. Quickly, let's jot down a second thing. Another reason we know that the Lord Jesus is coming, and notice how Paul drives this home, is he wants us to receive incredible comfort of this coming. He wants us to receive something out of this. Go down to verse number 18, or, uh, or in, in, in verse number 18 that we read a moment ago, I mentioned to you that many times people preach and teach these verses to frighten. And maybe if we're not prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus, we ought to be frightened. I mean, m- I mean maybe, maybe we already feel threatened to know that we're not spiritually prepared. But that's not what Paul's writing here. Paul is writing these verses to comfort. Look in verse number 16 at how he does this. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, and he'll do so with a loud command. Some of you have this word, a loud voice. With the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
You see, the first thing that Paul begins to do is he begins to lay an important foundation. These people have questions. How, how's all this going to work, Paul? We don't understand it. We know the Lord's coming back. We got that. You seem to be sure of that. And we're kind of somewhat sure ourselves. But how, how's everyone going to be gathered together? And so Paul begins speaking out of the majesty of our Lord's return. Now notice what it says, the Lord himself. Do you see that statement? The Lord himself's going to come. He's not going to dispatch angels. He's, he's not going to send a, some entourage in his place. The Lord himself, the Bible says, will be coming. I love over there in Acts chapter 1, I believe it's verse number 11, you know, Acts 1.11 is at that very moment when Jesus, whoosh, he ascends. Boy, that, that must have been a moment. And evidently, there was quite a stir for those that were able to witness that and see that. Whoosh, he's gone. And Acts chapter 1 and verse 11 says, and I love this. They look to some of those that are discouraged and they use these two words. It's the same Jesus. The same Jesus that died is going to be coming back. The same Jesus that was put in that tomb is going to be coming back. The same Jesus that just arose is going to be coming back. And I love how Paul just drives home the Lord Jesus himself will be coming. I hear people all the time that tell me, well, I think, uh, not, not so much in our church, but just in conversation, well, I think the Lord Jesus has already come, come back. When I came to know the Lord Jesus, that's what the Bible talks about in his second appearance. He's appeared to me through my salvation. Well, I'm excited that, that the Lord appeared to you in your salvation, but that's not the second coming that Paul's talking about. Others will say something, well, the Lord Jesus visited me when the Holy Spirit indwelt me and sealed me like the book of Ephesians teaches. Well, that's exciting to me that the Holy Spirit, and if you say Jesus has appeared to you, wonderful, but that's not the second coming that the Lord Jesus is, is going to be making that Paul's referencing. Understand it's the same Jesus that came. That one will be, he'll, his body will be marked by those same imprints in his hands and feet. Jesus will return. One day, Jesus will rise from his throne and there will be an actual visible return. Do you see how Paul is driving that home? The Lord himself will come. He'll come down from heaven. Now notice this. He doesn't talk just about his majesty and the majestic return, but he speaks of the real miracle here of our resurrection. Look at the uh, second part of, uh, of uh, verse number 16. With the voice of an archangel, with this loud command, and with the trumpet all of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? The dead in Christ shall come forth. I just stop here for a moment because you and I are kind of yoked together in something here that all of us, whether we'll admit it or not, you know, I'm kind of a transparent kind of guy. Deep down, probably in all of our hearts, there's this driving question, how is he going to do this? How do you open up graves? How do you bring those that have already come to be with him? And how do, you, how do you take those that are with Jesus, those that are living, and we'll talk about this rapture and being caught up here in just a moment, but how do you take all of these people, put them all together, and, and pastor, we are confused. We're a little overwhelmed. We're just trying to think, how could that even happen? And I just remind you of something very important. You and I may never, ever, and probably won't come to an understanding of how our God can do all these things, but I just remind you that it's our God that created everything we know out of nothing. 
God created everything out of nothing. And so I want to encourage you as we study God's word and we know as much as we can and we learn as much as we can, which is a wonderful concept, understand this, it's not so much how God will do this, but he will do this. You do understand, don't you, just as an extra, that God's going to wipe all this mess out. You know from your Old Testament, don't you, that God's just going to, I mean, he's going to come in and start with a clean slate. Listen to how Isaiah described this in Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Isaiah said in Isaiah 65, 17, see, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will, will not even be remembered, nor will they even come to mind. God, as he chooses, is going to return and all this stuff's going to be wiped out. Revelation 21.1, you know that verse. Right at the end of our Bible says, and then I saw a new heaven, a new earth. That's, that's what God chooses to put into place. That's what he makes and creates. The first heaven and the first earth are passed away and there'll no longer be any sea. But I think that what's important here are these sounds where we recognize his coming. Look at them in verse number 16. Do you see those three sounds? A shout. There'll be a loud command, depending on what translation you have as to how it's worded. There'll be a shout. Now that word literally means command or, a, or authoritarian voice. So the NIV translates that command right on target there, but it's something more than victory. I don't know how you term it and what you think that sound will be that Jesus himself will shout. I think maybe we have a little precursor of that in John chapter 11 when Jesus said, speaking to a dead Lazarus that had just been resurrected but still in those grave clothes, come forth. Maybe that's the kind of voice that we're going to be hearing. By the way, have you ever thought about the fact that every time that Jesus shouted, Somebody was coming back to life. Put your thinking caps on. The Bible says the first time that we hear that Jesus shouted, Lazarus came forth. The second time that we hear the Lord Jesus shouting was in a moment of tremendous pain and agony as Jesus hung on the cross. The Bible says he shouted. It is finished. Just as a precursor for what was about to happen, he was about to come back to life upon that death again. You know, it's interesting also, isn't it? Over at the end of Matthew, you, you hear that when the Lord Jesus shouted that, the Bible says graves opened up. Tombs and graves opened up. And now we have this incredible moment. Paul says, let me tell you something, church. When the Lord Jesus comes back, you're going to hear a command, an authoritarian command. And when you do, when he shouts, we know again there are going to be people coming back to life. Amen? Man, that's exciting. Man, I get stoked about that right there. That's the first sound we're going to hear. But look at the second one. There's a voice, not just a shout, but a voice. Look at it right there in verse 16. The voice. Now, who is the archangel? Daniel tells us that is the archangel Michael. That's kind of interesting that, that, that Paul includes that description here. But not so much un unusual, unique, because we know that Satan himself, the prince of the air, was a fallen, what? A fallen angel himself. And here's the archangel that begins with a loud voice to say, give way, give way, make way for the Savior. But there's a third sound, look at it, the trumpet. You see it there in verse 16? And the trumpet, it's going to sound the call of God. It'll be, it'll be signifying and signaling that the Lord's returning. You know, the trumpet was really sounded for two reasons, wasn't it, in the Bible? For worship and for warfare. The trumpet sounded for worship and for warfare. And in doing so, 
people knew that when it sounded, something significant was about to happen. But I love verse 17. Look at it with me. Here, he's driving home this concept of when the Lord Jesus returns, the real marvel of the reunion of how we're, what we're going to experience. After that, he says, we are all still alive. We, that, we all that are still alive, he says, and our left will be caught up. Well, rapto, harpazo, the Greek word there, to, to be caught up, to be gathered up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, it's interesting here because Paul uses the pronoun we. I guess Paul's in this category of those that think Jesus is going to return during their lifetimes. He doesn't say for those that are coming in the future. He says for we. Now, maybe he's talking about this from a believer standpoint as well, but maybe Paul has that expectation that the Lord Jesus would come during his lifetime. Now, that word rapture, that not used in the text, that shouldn't concern any of us because the word trinity is not used in the text. The word sovereignty is not used in the biblical text. The word missions is not used in the biblical text. There you go. But we accept all of those and place doctrines in connection with them. But the word rapture here, even if you don't like the word coming out of the Latin into the Greek language, maybe you can just use caught up or to catch up with him. That word, though, whether you like it or not, rapture, which we've built out of the Latin to the English, is accurate in what Paul is teaching here. That those that are, remain alive when the Lord Jesus returns, he's going to snatch them up. He's going to pull them up. By the way, every time harpazo is used throughout the New Testament, it's used in a number of different ways. It's used to seize with force. There was a time that Jesus was being taken and he was being pulled and grabbed because there was a group of people that wanted to make a king out of him. They were trying to seize him to allow him to be king. That was one way the word was used. Another place is to be transferred, meaning was to be transferred from one place to another. Paul says, said, I was caught up. I was caught up into a third heaven. We know Paul got to see a glimpse into the heavenlies. And going from earthly sphere to the heavenly sphere, he used this word, I'm caught up, I'm gathered up. The word's also used over there in Acts 17 to mean to, to be delivered from danger. Paul was, there was a riot and Paul was being pulled this way and that way. Some soldiers burst in in Acts 17, pulled him to safety. And so we see from some of those meanings why Paul chose to use that word, to be caught up. Now, what a mystery. Over in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Paul says, behold, I show you a mysterion. I show you a real mystery. You know, this whole thing, isn't it? Here comes the Lord Jesus, and the Bible says when he returns, there'll be some folks coming with him. All those that have died previously, that have been with the Lord, they're coming with him. And the graves are going to open up. The sea, where all those old sailors, all those people that have died at sea, it's going to open up. People are going to be coming forth. The battlefield's coming forth. The graveyard's coming forth. And then what about those people that are alive? The Bible says they're going to be snatched up. They're going to be caught up with him. Does that sound like a little smacking of the supernatural? My friends, your and my faith is all supernatural. The birth of our Lord and Savior implanted into a virgin's womb, supernatural. Aren't you thankful for our Lord and Savior today? Man, I love him. I love our Lord and Savior. You love him? Are you excited about him coming back? I'm telling you, man, these are some encouraging words. But let me tell you, this word right here, I want you to look at it. Verse 17, we who are still alive are left to be caught up together. There's the word together. Just a few hours ago, they phoned us and said, Miss Madeline Scott has gone on to be with the Lord. Miss Madeline. You know, I just can't, I've shared this with you before. 
you know, every time someone in our fellowship that we so deeply love, when the Lord takes them back, a little bit of a piece of me goes with them. You know, the last words that Miss Madeline texts me, just about 11 hours before her death, the last words on my phone that she sent me after the last time I saw her, she said, I love my OHBC family. And I responded and I said, and we love you too. I'm so thankful that when the Lord returns, we're all going to be together. It's not going to matter about skin color. It's not going to matter about old grievances, old issues, old pains, old illness. All of that stuff's going to be away. And we are going to be together. You see how Paul is driving us home to a group of believers? They're new to all this. They're struggling on how all this is going to work. And then you and I understand because we have the closed canon of Scripture. We have so much more than they have. We still struggle with a number of these concepts. We've been battling for hundreds of years about premillennial or amillennial or postmillennial views. Let me tell you what's really important. The Lord is coming back. He's coming back. Wow. You know, the Bible teaches us that word together. When we are partakers of his nature, as God has told us that we are, if you and I are heaven born, then we know that we are what? Heaven bound. Such an important thing. Third thing, quickly. Look at the end of verse number 17. He wants us, and Paul gives to that church in Thessalonica a response here. He says, I want you to be able now to respond to this special challenge of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at, look, at, look at how he states this. He said, we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Now, let me tell you something, that concept, to meet the Lord, do you see that right there toward the end of verse 17, to meet the Lord? That's not a casual word. When you look at the Greek New Testament there, that's not like, hey, let's run down to Starbucks and have a meeting. That's not what that word means. This word as it's used in the Greek text is not a casual word, but it's a technical word. It's a word that is used only with an official entourage or, for instance, a returning ambassador. Maybe a better generic term would be when we entertain a dignitary. This is not just any meeting when our Lord and Savior comes and we're to meet with him. This is a very important meeting. We're going to be meeting with our Lord and Savior. Did you see the other day? Big, big splash. Uh, surveys are a big buzzword right now. I guess, I guess we as Americans, many sheltering in place and with the change of how everything's working, we have more time on our hands in some cases than we probably need. And so surveys are just abundant. Just a few weeks ago, they surveyed Americans across the board. Gallup said now that 81% of all the people they surveyed believed in a heaven. Now, I say not in the heaven, but in a heaven. That's exactly how the survey stated it. 72% said they believe in a hell. And 77% said they were optimistic about their chances of making it to a heaven. But you know, when you and I think about the coming of our Lord and Savior, that is going to happen. What you and I've got to focus on, the challenge that's in front of us, is we've got to be, do a better job at living with this eternal view of things. How you and I are functioning, what we're accomplishing. We're moving around here at a pace that we think, you know what, no big deal. Many of us are living our lives without a sense of urgency. We are living in days that are urgent. The gospel message that we have, our lives and what they represent and the emblem of us being in the very 
nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so important that it exudes and extends to others. And we've got to remember, secondly, that you and I have got to make the most of our time. You remember the incredible verses in Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16? The Bible says, be very careful then how you live. Not as an unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because these days are evil. But most importantly, you and I are to live with that incredible anticipation of the Lord Jesus Christ. His return for us, an incredible Our hearts should be filled with the confidence and assurance that this will be, this, this will happen. I'm convinced that when it does, it will be the greatest day of your life ever. Would you stand with me this morning? In just a moment, we're going to close our service with a time of singing together. But before we do, I want us to pray for our nation. I want us to pray for a lost nation. Not just so much from a voting perspective, but that this next year, these next few months, that God might use his people to convey the gospel like never before. Let's pray together.